This is the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 28th, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Professional Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm going to be talking this week about what went on this week, which until we got to Friday wasn't really much. And even Friday, we basically just know that we might see more happen in the future, because if you hadn't heard about it, yes, the uh, government shutdown uh, is now over. So we'll talk about what that may mean in the IRS side of the equation. We'll also talk a little bit more this week about uh, information that was in the IRS's revenue procedure on how we're going to compute W-2 wages for 199 Cap A, and also take a look some more at uh, some more, you know, discussion of what's going on with those Cap A final regulations. Try to get a feeling of, you know, how that's working, what issues we're running into, what we're seeing as I talk with people, follow along on some Twitter threads, on some bulletin boards, just trying to see where things maybe are going here on the 199 regulations. Now, you know, it is that time, tax season. Oh, by the way, yes, don't forget, happy start of filing season. Because now, January 28th, the IRS begins accepting returns on the date this podcast is, you know, officially titled the date. So here on January 28th, the IRS will begin accepting returns. Uh, we're not too sure. You know, there's a lot of stuff still missing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Certainly, I suspect your tax software is right now either not calculating 199 capital deductions at all, just asking you, what do you want on line nine? Or if it is calculating it, probably at least in certain circumstances is doing it wrong, at least until they get a revised version of the software out following the issuance of the final regulations. But so we'll probably not have a whole lot actually filed for most of us here listening to the broadcast this week on January 28th. But at least theoretically, you can start filing on that date. And it is time, you know, tax season's coming. For those of us here in Phoenix, it means we get to be inside while the weather outside is not is nice and we're stuck inside. Uh, for those of you in the rest of the country, a lot of you, at least you have a, at least you have one advantage. Most of the time you're stuck inside during tax season. The weather outside is not so wonderful. So, you know, April 15th begins to get kind of nice. So you can go outside again. Those of us here in Phoenix, April 15th comes and it begins to get kind of warm, shall we say. Well, it's an interesting week. Again, not much happened this week, and that's not surprising. The 199 Cap A regulations is what everybody's been waiting on. There's only one more. Re there's only one more regulation project that is still at OIRA that needs to come out, and so that means we don't have a whole lot in the pipeline right now. And without the IRS or the tax court being open, uh, certainly there wasn't a lot of other guidance that was going to happen. So we have a very kind of quiet week going on. But we do have some things to talk about. And the first thing we're going to have is the shutdown ended. But the problem we've got is that the IRS now kind of needs to catch up. And there's a couple of articles that have talked about this. Uh, the one I'm going to cite from is from the Washington Post. But there's been other places you're going to find this. And regardless of whether you, you know, whether you believe, because obviously the Post story was from another one of these anonymous sources who had briefed uh, the congressional committees but didn't have the right to speak. That's always kind of interesting as to why they're doing it and what their point is. But the story, at least from a practical standpoint, makes a lot of sense that we're going to have issues here. Just to remind you, the government was shut down for 35 days. Now, that means 35 days of things not happening at the IRS. And that also meant 35 days of people not answering the phone at the IRS. The story reports that the IRS, toward the end of the shutdown, was receiving 700,000 letters per day. That's up from the rather standard 200,000 they had been receiving. That is plausible because, as you're probably aware, if you tried to call the IRS during the shutdown, you didn't get too far. If you tried to fax in a power of attorney, you didn't get too far. You know, in essence, the only way you could communicate, not really, but at least document you did something, an attempt to do something with the IRS, was to write them before the time period expired. So not surprisingly, as this dragged on, the number of letters kept increasing. Because, yes, I mean, we all know about clients who ignore those letters from the IRS. We've all had that issue. But a lot of people actually do pay attention to that. And the date was coming up and they weren't able to fax anything in and they weren't able to talk about the IRS. So the only option on that letter, that notice they got, which, by the way, the computers ran. So all the notices kept coming out. 
The only thing they could do per the notice, you know, to have responded in time was to mail something in. So the IRS has that, you know, huge chunk of letters. So additional letters are not processing the letters they were getting and the letters are coming in a more rapid pace. The report we have is that there are 5 million letters <laughs> waiting for the IRS when they come in on Monday morning uh, and they've got a backlog there. Now, let's be honest, in the best of times, the IRS does not respond terribly quickly uh, to most of your written requests. You know, we all love those letters. You know, you wait for a while, then you get the letter telling you that uh, that they'll get to your letter, you know, somewhere in the next 45 days. And at the same time, the computer's on autopilot, you know, sending out threatening notices. And that's always been kind of the way this has worked. Well, now they're saying with this 5 million letter backlog, the report was in the story that the Taxpayer Advocate Service had briefed, you know, TAS, so the Taxpayer Advocate briefed the congressional committees that in the TAS's estimation, it will take from 12 to 18 months for the IRS to get back to their not terribly quick response to letters that they had before because they have to work the backlog now. Uh, just be aware, you know, the government reopens on Monday and filing season opens on Monday, but I wouldn't exactly expect everything to work the way that you might hope it would work on Monday. Uh, definitely, you know, I expect it's going to still be troublesome getting through on the phone because Monday, everybody who had gotten a notice you know, all, all of us who have those notices are going to be trying to call the service on Monday. There's going to be a huge stack up. I expect major problems for a while because it's just going to take a while to work to work a backlog of a month. There's a month worth of time there, which basically is not going to be recovered. And that means that we've got to deal with all that stuff. And as I said, the computers kept going. So notices that we're going to send out levies, notices of you know intent to levy, all those things kept going out on schedule. And that brings us to another little quirk here, which the IRS did issue an official statement on this. This is on their website, the IRS update on shutdown impact on tax court cases, important information with taxpayers and tax professionals with pending cases that came out on January the 25th of 2019. Uh, the IRS published a note there and they talk a lot. Remember, here's the problem. The IRS had issued the, you know, issued the letter. The 90 day letter was out. Now, some 90 day letters obviously set to expire during the shutdown. And that's kind of a problem because obviously if you tried to mail something to the tax court, many people reported that what happened was it came back to you returned. Now the tax court, this page tells you that if that happened to you, you know, the tax court is suggesting you basically, you should have kept that letter. Hopefully you didn't throw away the postmark letter that showed you filed on time to do something with the tax court. Uh, if you did keep that, you're supposed to basically return that. If you go online, you'll find this out along with your new petition. An interesting question the tax court is going to have to answer here very shortly is how much time do you have to file? Let's say your statute expired. Now, we had a case from a couple of years ago that when we had a snow day problem that shut down the tax court for a couple of days, as long as the petition got to the tax court by the, you know, by the first day after. So basically when they reopened, you were fine. Well, it's kind of a problem this time because they were sending them back. I doubt that most of us, you know, most people who are doing this, not us, I don't file tax court petitions, but most people that do, I doubt they're going to all fly to DC to be able to walk their petition in on Monday morning. So it would become an interesting issue. I suspect the tax court will have to give some guidance that petitions received by date X that had a filing date in that particular time frame will be considered timely filed. There may be a longer time frame if you do have that postmark letter showing that you filed your petition or you attempted to during that time frame. So we'll just have to watch this. Now the IRS has a couple of things on the page you should be aware of. First thing is, and this would affect tax court cases, non-tax court cases. Interest definitely continues to accrue during the government shutdown. So even though we couldn't resolve the matter during the shutdown period, interest accrued, the IRS does discuss there, and it's discussed if you download the documents that we write up each week, uh, we have discussion there in there of what the IRS said about reminding you that you could go ahead and make a payment even while you continue to dispute the matter in the tax court, et cetera, in order to try to stop the running of interest. 
But that's going to be an issue because, yeah, remember, the tax court also missed 35 days. So a lot of tax court stuff is going to take longer to get processed than it had in the past because we have 35 days. Certain certain uh, you know, certain scheduled trial dates were postponed. So now we got to see how that gets rescheduled. So, yeah, we've got that interest issue. And also the IRS noticed, well, guess what? The IRS issued you a 90-day letter. Well, you know, day 90 fell on January 7th. You obviously couldn't get your petition filed. If it wasn't filed before the 22nd of December and in the tax court's hands, it's not getting in there. The problem is the IRS, therefore, will not have gotten notice that you filed the tax court petition. Therefore, they go to assessment and then they start moving with collection. That's how the computer has been moving. The IRS notes on this page that there is going to be uh, a problem of that sort. They claim that counsel is supposed to identify these cases where there was a, as the IRS refers to a premature assessment, and that they are going to, you know, request those be abated. Uh, be aware of this. That kind of implies that, well, you know, you're at their mercy. You're not really. There are there are ways, and obviously counsel would be able to have ways to force them to pay attention to this, you know, and give and take an action that will be, you know, kind of reduce the burden. But you need to be aware of all this happening. If you've got a client who had a deadline that fell during that period, which was the shutdown period, uh, you know, we're going to have to pay attention, kind of see what happens. Similar things are going to be true about things like 30-day letters and all those types of things. I mean, we've got the same basic problem. How do we make this work? Uh, again, pay attention. This week, I expect we'll start getting some guidance from the IRS, from tax court, et cetera, about how we deal with these problems created by the government being shut down for 35 days when deadlines fell within those 35 day periods and we were simply unable to do what we wanted to do during that time frame. Next up, we have a revenue procedure. This is revenue procedure 28, 2019. 11 issued on January 18th of 2019. This was revenue procedure about the computation of W-2 wages. And this is one of those things, remember we had told when the proposed rates came out, we were issued a, you know, a in a notice, a draft revenue procedure that told us of the three methods we could use to compute W-2 wages. We were told that they were going to take comments on this and it would be released as final eventually. When the proposed regs were turned final, we got the final regs came out uh, basically now back about a week and a half ago. We were able to, we got at the same time, this proposed revenue procedure, or the, this actual revenue procedure, it went final. It kept the, stand, the same three ways of filing that we had before, our three methods. And, you know, we need to select one method to use consistently. Now, the three methods. So here's the catch. We have to select a method and whatever method we use, and except for the you know one exception we've got here. But whatever method we use, we have to consistently use in the future. The three methods are called the unmodified box method, the modified box one method and the tracking wages method. What the unmodified box method does. I should say unmodified box. I think I said unmodified box one. Should be unmodified box. What the unmodified box method does is take a look at your total entries in box one of all W-2s, which generally you're going to find, you know, in, a, in cases where you're not having multiple W-3s, you're just filing one set of W-2s, it'll be on the front page of the W-3. Or you take the total of all the box fives, which are the Medicare wages. Again, that'll probably be on the front page of W-3. You take the lower of those two numbers. Why the lower? Because this is meant to be the simple way of doing it. This is quick and dirty, and the IRS, is, the IRS assures if you do quick and dirty, you're never going to be able to gain advantage by doing that. It's always going to be kind of a disadvantage of using quick and dirty. But if you have a scenario, let's say, where you have income every year of about 100 grand that's flowing through, and you have W 2 wages of a million, then, you know, there's no realistic risk that we're ever going to be W-2 limited. In which case then, who cares? Use this method. Maybe we're giving up $40,000 of wages, but since we had a million, who cares? We don't need that last 40,000. So that's a concept there. It is a quick and dirty, 
I don't know. I would expect a lot of people to use it unless you have a very, 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 uh, you know, simple accounting system where you just don't have any processing power, can't get reports and can't, you know, the computer can't automate the system of doing this. So what you're doing is just getting a printout of what the payroll guys tell you and then using that payroll number going forward. The second method is the modified box one method. Uh, under the modified box one method, you take the total amounts of box one, that's generally taxable wages, right? Then you subtract from that amount, uh, you know, things that are not wages, fair income tax holding purposes, uh, including, right, they're treated for wages, you know, they're treated as wages. So like supplemental employee compensation benefits, um, all those sorts of things that are, you know, they're in there, but they shouldn't be. And then reverse to that, add back things, you know, like your, you know, we're talking about the payments for retirement plan, uh, withholding issues for things like HSA numbers, all those things that go into box 12. And that, now again, in this case, you got to go W2 by W2, find each of these specific adjustments and adjust box one. But if you do that, you're going to get a much more accurate amount of wages than you're going to get if you do the unmodified box method. But it's a bit more work. And I say a bit more work because it seems like it should take little time for a payroll vendor to be able, you know, whoever runs your payroll system, to generate a report that should be able to come up with a modified box one number and give you a report to back it up. Okay. I expect a lot of businesses to use modified box one, especially if it appears you could be W-2 limited at any point in the future. Finally, the tracking wages method. Now, the tracking wages method, you track total wages, subject fair income tax withholding, and make appropriate modifications to W-2 wages. So this one, unlike the other two, tracking wages method actually digs into your accounting system and gets the real wage numbers out of there. Okay. So it doesn't run just off the W-2. It gets its hands dirty and gets in there with the real numbers. Again, it's numbers that will go on the W-2 because all three of these will use calendar year reporting, even if you're a fiscal year entity. Calendar year reporting will still be used. But you'll be able to use one of those three methods, right? Now, essentially, you know, if you use a short, if you have a short period, short year, you can only use wages for that short year. Uh, there are a little bit different methods if your short year does or does not include the end of the calendar year. And that's mentioned in the revenue procedure. You can read about that. Uh, there are some cases where some additional computations may be needed that are discussed in the revenue procedure to go through from that step. But the key issue is this year, you're going to be choosing one of these three methods. So you want to make sure you've studied what are your options. Don't just rush through to get, you know, to get something in there and get it filed. The way this revenue procedure reads, whatever method we choose this year is going to be, we're going to be stuck with that method going forward. So you want to make sure if you're using the unmodified box method, uh, make sure you really are good with using that method. It's quick and dirty, but it can cause problems down the line. If you want to use the modified box one method, then yeah, you got to start working up some ways to get the data you need to do that calculation. This year, because your payroll system may not have been updated for the proposed revenue procedure, you may very well have to go through and put together an Excel sheet, do some exports from your payroll system, and then work up your computation that way. Uh, tracking wages method, that would be where you try to get a report that's going to come out of your ledger system to give you a number to go there. But again, remember, we are choosing this this year. So keep track of that side of it. Okay, well, that kind of finished it for developments per se, but we do want to talk some more about what actually has been going on. Okay, this will be, let's talk some more about the final regs. And the final regulations, which we discussed last week, uh, this week I did do a web webcast you know, for the Idaho Society CPAs. We ran it on Friday. We had over 50 people signed in for that. So it was a you know fairly big webinar for us to get done at this point. So we got a nice group in there and we had a lot of questions and things came up. And I obviously got to take a much deeper dive than I was able to do last week when I was just kind of trying to uh, get something put together and understood at the end of the week and you know rushing to update manuals to get this done. So there are a couple of things I've noticed. Now, like I said, I've been doing both that program for the Idaho Society, the webcast, 
But then I also was, you know, following on Twitter and on state society discussion forums on, you know, on Reddit. And interesting enough, I got more than once people had this question about PEOs and leased employees. Uh, really nothing changed from the proposed regs. And the proposed regs said very clearly that if you are leasing your employees, those will still be your W-2 wages. So if your company pays a PEO to handle all the payroll aspects, and technically your employees are employees of the PEO, the IRS says, we understand that's not really the PO's employees. They're yours. You will be able to pick those up and count them. The reg is very clear on this. You know, it, it was handled. I know the PO's got all worked up when the, re when the rules first came down, the law first came down. They were very upset, but we pretty much have guidance here. This one has been answered. One thing to note about the final regs, they did move for almost every, I think, and I think it was for every place, they talked about a related party, from what had been at times a list internally to the 199 cap A regulations that would have determined what a related party was for purposes of determining, for instance, if we look at the aggregation rules, you know, do we have common ownership? Well, common ownership includes direct and indirect, and does common ownership count you know, if some relative of mine owns shares, which relatives count for common ownership? How about if I'm a beneficiary of an estate that has an interest in it? Is that common ownership? Well, the IRS, after going with this listing before, in that particular case with aggregation, we had a very limited family list. They've now gone to 267D and 707B, the standard most stand, most often standard listing of related parties in the tax code. So we now have a pretty straightforward. The good news is with the change to 267B, one big thing that happens is uh, now my brother or sister and I are able to, to attribute ownership across to each other. Why that's important under these rules, most often being able to attribute ownership gives you flexibility. Remember, if there's common ownership, the triple net lease can count as a trader business to the, you know, to the related party, the related flow through party that we're leasing to. So it's actually useful for us to have more expanded and standard list of who the related parties are. The IRS also made it very clear in these regs that they are not really happy with the theory a lot of people had. Of, Why don't I take my accounting firm and let's divide up into pieces. For instance, let's take my accounting firm. You know, a large part of what I do, you know, I've got a pretty good chunk of time I spend that is related in my accounting firm to preparing, handling, giving these continuing education sessions. You know, so we do those things and we run, you know, it's part of my accounting firm. I do it there. So the question becomes, could we carve that off as a separate trader business from the accounting work I do for clients where I'm doing, you know, doing basically tax returns, financial statements, you know, we do some bookkeeping work for some people. Can I separate those two apart? The proposed reg suggested, kind of interestingly, that it might not be that tough to do. Specifically, I'm thinking about the dermatologist example in the proposed regs, which was which dealt with the incident with basically incidental business. In that case, remember we had a dermatologist who was also selling skincare products out of the dermatology office. They used the same employees. They sold to the same patients. It said nothing about having separate books. It said nothing about, you know, any sort of separate employees. Uh, and they determined that based on that, you know, they said, but the skincare products were less than 5% of the total. That was in the proposed regs, a key as to when you had to combine businesses. They said, well, they got to be combined. But when you think about it, those had to be two separate trader businesses or the example wasn't proving what it meant to prove. You had to combine businesses in the final regs. I think they figured out that people are going to read it that way. And now they've changed it. If you go in the final regs, you're going to see an example of a veterinary clinic that also develops and sells dog food. And in this case, you know, they're saying, you know, basically that, we have two trades or businesses and how they develop that is they have separate employees. They keep separate books. They write everything on separate invoices. 
even though they're in the same building. And keeping all that separate detail with the separate employee, et cetera, uh, then they say we have two trades or businesses. In most cases, we're not going to be able to do that kind of split to say there are two TOBs. I do see that sometimes we talk about I, you know, let me say I, I centers. We'll see the medical part, the ophthalmologist, the optometrist that are in one part of the building. And then there is a separate distinct employee and a separate distinct payment when you go to like buy the lenses. I think those structures work. That's pretty much what they're talking about here with the vet. I've never seen a vet structured the way they have this example structured. But it's much more difficult. They're using the 400, 446, actually 446 rules. Basically, at, from their viewpoint, they seem to be requiring you to have separate books and records. That is, you keep separate books and records. You have separate employees. The, the vet example is suggesting a much more difficult way of being able to separate trader businesses than what we saw in the implication of the dermatology example in the proposed regs. The IRS decided that's probably how people are going to try to get around it. It's also important to note that the former employee presumption, remember, any amount we earn as an employee is not eligible for the 20%. And the proposed regs said if we had ever been an employee. So, for instance, if I had ever been an employee of the CPA firm, right, that let's say now I'm getting flow through 199 cap A income from, that I would be presumed to be an employee of that CPA firm. As you're probably aware, a lot of them, you know, we're talking about larger local CPA firms, obviously international and national firms. They tend to get their partners from people who started there or at least worked there some as employees. So, and the proposed reg suggested that that presumption went all the way back. Had they ever been, you know, the fact that I might have been on W2 in 1995 would taint me today the question of am I an employee of the accounting firm? And, you know, as opposed to being a flow through member, a flow through partner. Well, now the IRS in the final regulations changed that to only a three-year look back. So for instance, if you are a partner in the accounting firm in 2018, well, if you got that partnership in the last three years, then the presumption is you're an employee. You got to prove the presumption wrong. But if you got your partnership interest in 1995, then that presumption is not there anymore. They also gave us specific guidance on how to prove. You know, on sort the sort of evidence that you're going to need to bring in once the IRS notifies you that they think you may be an employee. And finally, the key other change was they allow pass-through entities, RPEs, relevant pass-through entities, partnerships, S corporations, and in some cases, you know, if they're distributing out income to beneficiaries, trusts and estates, RPEs can aggregate. In the proposed regs, only the trust and estate could aggregate. Because the trust in the state was the one, you know, because it was both a taxpayer and an RPE. But now we're able to uh, actually aggregate essentially at the partnership S Corp level. Now, if you do that, you're taking flexibility away from the downstream owners, from the from the equity holders, most likely. Although, again, it's possible the S could aggregate, but they couldn't. Uh, it's difficult to see how that would happen but I guess potentially possible if I really thought about it. But you're taking it away. In essence, in most cases, you're clearly taking it away because they could choose to aggregate or not. However, if we know we're aggregating, all of the partners are aggregating, all the S-Corp shares are aggregating, it greatly simplifies doing the S-Corp return as opposed to having to pass out two different trades or businesses. So definitely that's helpful. Now, again, lots of things happening here. These are still highlights of it. If you've not gone through the regs, go through them. We are going to be doing additional days of sessions right in this. And specifically, my next state society session I'll be giving will be an eight hour course on this. The good news about the eight hour course is we actually have time to take things a little more leisurely and actually deal with questions in line. As those who are involved in the program on Friday know, uh, I, I end up and I do this because I got to make sure the time doesn't get away from us. And I've seen it get away. We have a situation like this that is really hot. So I handled the questions, you know, in two blocks. One at the end, we took our break. 
after the first two hours, and then the other at the end of the whole session. We just answered questions and went down that path. In this case, live, probably going to be able to do a lot more handling questions live in the mix because eight hours gives you time to do it. We can walk through more examples. That'll be February the 11th, eight hours. Arizona Society of CPAs, ASCPA.com is where you find them, uh, is where they'll be. Uh, if you're in the Phoenix area, uh, it's an in-person course. We'll be down at the Society offices. Uh, wherever you are, you can take it as a webcast. It will start at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Uh, so for those of you who have trouble translating time zones, that would be 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and would be at, you know, will be at, I should say not 6 a.m., but 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then it would be 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you're in Guam, it's way off. You know, we'll just, that that's middle of the night time. If you're in Hawaii, it's actually still pretty dang early to do it. And if you, where I was earlier this year, if you're off in, uh, you know, if, if you're off in the U.S. Virgin Islands, well, okay, you got another hour off. So it's like 11. And it's not bad starting at 11. It's kind of leisurely start time, but it does mean you'll be hanging around pretty late in the evening. Uh, but we're going to be doing a whole session there. We also are booking a second session of the four-hour webinar for Idaho. That will come on February the 13th. So if you want to go get one of my sessions, you know, you can find us there. No problem. We'll have the state society options there in both of those cases. A lot of other options are coming up with other state societies. Uh, you know, not ones that necessarily I'm doing, but we have other people running sessions. So, you know, be sure to take a look. I think it's really important before tax season starts that everybody like get the refresher of what the final regs did on 199 cap A. So make sure you take a look at what course offerings you have available to you. This has been the current federal tax developments. Again, this, my, my updates, and hopefully this week we'll have updates this past week. There wasn't much to update, but you know, about the, except for the tax court issue, there wasn't much to write about. Uh, hopefully this week we'll start getting some stuff from the IRS we can write about. When we do, it'll be online at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to me by email, edzollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, Twitter handle, follow me at edzollers on Twitter. I follow state society discussions, as I've told people, if you're a member of the Arizona Society of CPAs, the Minnesota Society of CPAs, New Jersey Society of CPAs, you can ask questions and post on their Connect sites. I try to watch those and respond if I think I can help in those areas. So you can post there. Cal CPA's tax talk, I look in on from time to time. And then I also, you know, am involved on the Reddit, subreddit of slash r slash tax pros. So you can find some information there. Uh, definitely lots going on. You know, take a look. By the way, those places are great if you're not going to do anything and interact with me. Uh, there's lots of discussion going on there about all kinds of issues related to this. People ask their questions. And by the way, people are comparing notes on how their tax software is handling 199 Cap A. Uh, for the moment, let's just say it's bad and inconsistent. Uh, don't trust your tax software at all on what goes on line nine on Form 1040 at this point, because there definitely are some bad things happening. Also, be very careful about what it puts out as QBI. Uh, if you're doing a partnership or S corp, like double, triple check how it's coming up with things. With that, well, IRS is back. We hopefully will have things actually happening so that next week I won't have to talk more about 109 Cap A proposed regs and talk some more other issues. We'll have some real developments to talk about. So be sure to join us next week back here on current federal tax developments.